So, uh, Dr. Vinicius de Carvalho, thank you very much indeed thank for you. your time. My pleasure. Um, so, you're a senior lecturer in Brazilian studies at King's College. Um, you also the author of the book um, Military Music in the War of the Triple Alliance and you are the chief editor of the academic journal Brasiliana and you contributed to the uh, exhibition catalogue of the current exhibition here exactly. now uh, The Art of Diplomacy, exactly. Brazilian Modernism Painted for War so you're pretty busy indeed <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's part of life <laughs> <laughs> So. Um, we are uh, so here uh, to focus um, on the exhibition that is currently on show here at the Embassy of Brazil in London, and which references the 1944 exhibition which was held at the Royal Academy of Arts um, in the middle of World War II. Mm -hmm. um, pretty big historic um, event. So my first question to you is, in your view, in terms of contemporary contexts, have the British public who are interested in world art and British cultural institutions changed their perceptions or misconceptions of Brazilian art and Brazil as a country since 1944? Well, I think the answer for your question is uh, a yes and a no. Um, in some way, it changed a lot, the perception of Brazil, of course, and the Brazilian art from 1944 up to today. Uh, that, that has to do with uh, the, the immense development of Brazilian art and the, the expansion of the market of Brazilian art, in some way a professionalization of this market of art, uh, and also with the, the engagement of Brazil in the world since then. So Brazil today is not the Brazil of 1944, as well as not Britain, and that means that uh, the interactions, the global interactions are much more um, developed and deeper uh, in other hands, there is always a sort of expectation towards Brazil of being an exotic place and everything coming from there should have or reflect some sort of exoticism. Right. And I think this expectation is still there. Uh, recently in one of the, the journal articles uh, that referred to the, to the exhibition here, if I well remember was in the Times, um, the critic who wrote the article was talking about the exhibition uh, demanding from it what the exhibition was not actually trying to say. And I think that is exactly what it mm. has, the mm. 1944, with this exhibition in common and what didn't change so much. Right. I think the questions and demands and expectations from, from Britain are not exactly what um, the Brazilians, the Brazilian artists, right. want to show or to tell. So the dialogue was not so, so easy here because uh, it's like the Brazilian artists saying something and the British audience expecting to hear something else. So this is something that probably is still here. But this tension is very necessary and very good right. because it's exactly this tension that makes the exhibition again so um, exciting today oh, because it tries to break uh, this tendency, uh, especially an external tendency in looking at Brazilian art in general both music, literature, or, or uh, visual arts um, as, as a both extremes. Or in one side, it must be an art denouncing the social problems of uh, underdeveloped countries, yeah. so engaged art. Or in the other hand, being an art that shows the exoticism of a beautiful nature, of, uh, of the sun, the tropical weather. So I think this, this exhibition, it breaks this sort of binary uh, tendence of looking at Brazilian art in general. Yes, I think you, you, you're absolutely right. Um, I do think, though, that um, given the history of Brazilian modern art and how avant-garde some of the, uh, those ex artistic experiments in Brazil taking place in the early modernist period in Brazil would have been a little bit difficult for the perhaps for the British uh, wider audience to understand. Um, perhaps I think that France or the French because of the, of the obviously the history between France and Brazil, would have a better or would have had a better understanding of some of those works of art that were shown in the period, yeah. but also uh, currently. Yeah. It seems to me perhaps yeah. I'm wrong. But the, the interaction between France and Brazil was normally and historically uh, much more fluent and constant than the British, for example, and especially uh, in the in the early modern, uh, not early modern because that would yes. be understood <laughs> as, as Renaissance basically, but in the early modernism period, 
um, in, in the beginning of the 20th century. Many of those artists, they, they study or went to France for a while. And in some way, uh, France helped to, to, to demand or to ask from those Brazilian artists what they want to say. Um, it's very interesting when we think about music, that's another, another art that I'm quite involved with. Um, Villa Lobos went to France um, the first time, and he came performing lots of music that emulate a lot of French uh, impressionist music, especially Debussy. Right. And the French audience asked him, so what do you have original to tell us? What <laughs> sort of originality can you bring as a composer from Brazil? And then is when Villa Lobos start to, to incorporate some of those folkloric elements in his music and start really to, to be this father figure of the nationalism in Brazilian music. Right. So it is towards a French demand, a French questioning right. of his originality. Um, and then this, is, this is, helps in the dialogue because there is a question, there is a demand. There is not an expectation in the sense of right. what I want from you right. uh, or what I, I think that you will give to me. I have really doubts about right. what you, you are want, want to show or to give. And that is, I think, the, the differential element of this, of this period. And our modernism in Brazil was still a movement that was trying to, to make Brazil uh, as known as all other countries in Europe in the field of the arts. So it is also to show that we can talk to you in the same level. We can develop an art that is in the same level as your art. Um, and this is, this is another important point to be discussed here because yes, our artists, they are trying to, 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 to be in the same uh, way of expression that we are seeing here in Europe. Right. Uh, that will change definitely, uh, especially from the moment that those Brazilian artists, they start to discover that as much as they become original as Brazilians, as much as they will be modern in a Brazilian sense. Now that's very interesting. In fact, currently is a very interesting period for Brazilian, for Brazil um, in terms of politics and, and, and the economy, of course, uh, slightly darker there on that spectrum. But culturally, this is what strikes me about Brazil, is that currently you've got the Beatriz Milhares' show at the White Cube in London, who is a, a Brazilian, um, artist, very talented, based in Rio de Janeiro, uh, represented in London by a major uh, private art gallery. And then you've got this current exhibition here in the gallery of the Brazilian Embassy. And you've got, for the first time, a whole exhibition dedicated on the painter Tarsila do Amaral, who is part of the very first generation of Brazilian modernism mm -hmm. at MoMA Museum in New York. That's, this is huge and very, very inspiring. So this leads me to um, the second question I've got here for you. So reflecting on this post-colonial avant-garde Brazilian anthropophagic manifesto um, set out by Oswald de Andrade, which could be understood as celebrating cultural and racial hybridity through the symbolic action of devouring the culture and the colonizers in order to reach a more evolved society. Um, do you think then that the avant-garde discourse would have been understood by the British in the 1940s? Because it's in, it's a very, in terms of post-colonial history, yeah. it's, it's yeah. pretty progressive, isn't yeah. it? Well, I would say that, uh, and that's one of the arguments of my current research on cultural anthropophagy as a, as a hermeneutics of alterity. I, I would say that even today, we, people don't understand very well what or how to, how to explain or how to conceive this idea of cultural anthropophagy. And, um, well, first of all, I would not say that Oswald uh, uh, manifesto anthropophagico, uh, translated as cannibalist manifest. Yeah. Um, it was in, understood by him as a post-colonial, um, um, mm. Mm. like claim. We call that post-colonial today. It's about to, yeah, but, we are nowadays, yeah, but in retrospect. Exactly, yes, in retrospect. Yes. But for yes. Oswald, it was just a foundational text about what would be a Brazilian art. Uh, a Brazilian art that would be not in opposition to, to European art or any other art, or any other culture, not only art, but would be a, a, a culture that is inclusive in a quite violent way, because devouring the other is a violent act. Yes, indeed. And all the <laughs> language, exactly, anthropophagically <laughs> speaking, it's really a devoration of another. Yes. Um, and this is, this is 
uh, was constantly understood metaphorically, of course, as a metaphor of taking or appropriating what is from another uh, that could be the colonizer, but could be also from other cultures that are not necessarily right. the colonizers of, of Brazil, in order to, to create a pattern of a culture that doesn't define as a, an exclusive, but an inclusive. So the idea of Oswald is very interesting. Brazilian culture, it's not a culture that defines in opposition to another, but in relation to the other, taking what I want from this other to make it myself. Um, if we play that today in some, in some, uh, some methodological or even the, uh, philosophical aspect, what we are talking is also a provocation about alterity. How mm. I deal with the foreigner, how I deal with the stranger. Um, in a world like today, in which we are closing more and more our doors and gates and, and uh, frontiers and uh, borders and defining what is me, in opposition to another, I think this manifesto has a very important ethical claim today that what makes a strong culture, it's not protecting against the other, but is actually interacting with the other, interacting in a, in a very advanced uh, ontological exchange. Mm -hmm. And that is, I think, uh, when we read, for example, Eduardo Viveiros de Castro, right. the Brazilian anthropologist who wrote that fantastic book, from the enemy's point of view, describing what means exactly for the Tupinambas indigenous in Brazil to practice cannibalism, what sort of ontological perception was there, and in which he also created this or developed this concept of perspectivism. If we bring these things together, then we can talk about a post-colonial discourse. Right. And then we can talk that from 1928, when Oswald wrote the Manifesto Anthropophagic, until today, if we read and the development of a sort of construction of an idea of Brazilian culture and, why not to say, ontology, what we are trying or could make the world understand better is uh, it's not really uh, putting aside the, the, the different, the other, that I will protect myself and I will make myself stronger, but it's the opposite. It is relating to this other in a sort of anthropophagical ontological, mm. philosophical mm. way, or artistical. That's what, what is in the game here, no? Yes. Um, that's what I think that the Manifesto Anthropophagic was not understood in 1928 or 40, 40s here when the exhibition arrived with this art that is anthropophagical. Uh, and it's not either today, because um, we are still looking at this in, in a sort of defined Brazilian culture in opposition to the other cultures and especially the British culture. While Brazilian artists, I know, I don't want to be understood as opposition to, but as uh, integrated, as in a process of constant redefinition uh, of meanings through these anthropophagical processes, these cultural anthropophagical processes. It, it is, it, hence I think it's an incredibly progressive and avant-garde movement and manifesto, certainly for that period. Yeah. And I don't think, certainly the Brazilians did not understand the wider public in Brazil. Um, a lot of the Brazilian, local Brazilian bourgeoisie, both in Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo, uh, was looking to France. Yeah. So, you know, and so therefore this manifesto was incredibly um, progressive for the period. But neither for Britain, that owned, in 1944, still owned a huge colonial empire. So talking about cultural appropriation yeah. and as opposed to segregation, would have been a very controversial thing. Wouldn't yeah, it? yeah. Well, the problem with empires, and that was not different here, is that they always think that they are bringing civilization to the place where they are going, and that's what makes them imperialistic well, indeed, or yeah. uh, or not taking into consideration the order that they are meeting uh, in a, in the same way of looking uh, equality to to an other a dialogue in you know in a dialogue way so it is a positive colonial uh, process uh, in 1944 that was britain it was still a colonial power and that believed that from britain we could expand the civilization to the world and looking at brazilian art will be always like okay we can refine these things to make it more more close to the civilization 
that's exactly the, the misunderstanding uh, of this the, the way of looking at this exhibition. Brazilian artists were not coming here to, to be approved by, by British audience, but on the other hand, the Brazilian artists were sending their work here because they said, okay, we, we are going there to also eat you. That is, that is a very, that's a very, um, um, how to say that, it's a, it's a very uh, post-colonial way to right. act. Right. You know? right. It's right. to take in the voice. It is not to be in the position that somebody came here to choose which arts I want to bring to London. We right. are deciding by ourselves what we want to show to the world right. through the London eyes.